All right, good morning and welcome back. This week we will be in Acts chapter 3. Yes, Acts chapter 3. We have finally made it out of chapter 2 and we are in chapter 3. So uh, this summer we are working our way slowly through the book of Acts. Uh, so much good stuff in this book. Uh, so much good stuff, uh, including the unstoppable mission of the church, which is it's kind of something we touched on last week, and we will work within it today. Uh, listen, Acts is a book that gives us the history of the early church. It, it provides us an inside look at how the early believers came together, how they worshiped God together, how they reached out to the rest of the world. And the unstoppable mission of the church that we see here in Acts is the gospel. The good news, the, the good news that Jesus came to earth, God in the flesh, to live a perfect life and provide for us a way to know God. Uh, Jesus paid our penalty uh, for the sins that we committed. And as we live in a sinful world, as sinful people, we seek out the God who graciously heals and restores our lives who comes and heals our wounds and brings us into wholeness. We'll talk about more of that in a little bit. But uh, then we talked about several weeks ago how God then sent the Holy Spirit to descend upon us, to dwell within us, to write his law upon our hearts so that we may know him now and then forever live with him. And that is the good news. It is the gospel shared by the church so that the world may know. Uh, for it is through the church that the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to all the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. It's unstoppable. The gospel is the unstoppable mission of God given to the church. And we are privileged to share it with the world. What an awesome joy and responsibility that God has given us. So let's go ahead and get started this week. Let's jump into Acts chapter 3. And we're going to start in verse 1. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And it says this. One, one day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon. Now a man, crippled from birth, was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, Look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gates called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Okay, so just like every other week, there is a lot going on in this passage, uh, and it has been that way so far. Uh, but I want to give you, I want to point out a few background things uh, that we find in this package, contextualize some of the people and objects we've come across. And what makes it interesting is that in the description of some of these things, we see an unavoidable irony as we understand why they existed. And again, more of that in a minute. 
Uh, then after we discuss those things, we are going to put it all together. We'll work through this passage and see what it has for us today, what challenges uh, we can gain from this passage, uh, what we can use and remember as we leave uh, today. So first, some background information. I want to look at three main subjects, topics, uh, uh, the noun words, if you will, uh, in this passage and how these all play a role in this passage. Uh, the first subject I want to look at is the beggar. The beggar, who is, who was this man, right? Crippled from birth that is now sitting at the gate. So I think the first thing we need to realize is that in biblical times, the beggar represented one of the lowest have-nots in society. Uh, this would be a man unable to work, and therefore he was reduced to begging as his only hope of sustenance. Uh, someone in this time who is crippled, as this man was, they had no alternative, right? There wasn't any type of welfare system. Uh, he was completely and entirely dependent on others for everything. And when we, when we be when we begin to grasp this, when we carefully read the details of this passage, I mean, even to get to the temple in order to beg, he had to rely on others to get him there, right? Look at verse 2. It says, Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day. I mean, he was carried to the temple and they put him by the gate and left him there to beg. It would have been a miserable life with no way out of it. The second subject I want us to look at in this passage, I want us to see and understand the temple. Uh, based on the time of this passage, with Peter and John, uh, we're talking mid to early 30s. Uh, so this would have been the second temple, and it would have been constructed around 500-ish BC. Uh, it's discussed in the book of Naaman. Uh, but then King Herod came in, and he did a massive renovation of the temple. Uh, supposedly, I've read... I've read sources that say it lasting up to like 45 years. And in this time, he adorned it lavishly with gold decorated roofs, marble columns, just absolutely beautiful. The, uh, according to the Jewish historian, uh, Josephus, he said that the stones used in the construction were so exceedingly white that from a distance, it resembled mountain a mountaintop with snow on it and that the sun's reflection on uh, the gilding made it painful for onlookers to see. However, ancient Hebraic references also mention this temple by saying, he who has not seen the building that Herod the Great built has never seen a beautiful building in his life. And so here, in the shadow of this, of, of opulence, of the temple, sits a crippled man. Because strangely, the temple in the biblical period really represented exclusion. Uh, even archaeology that has uncovered stones from this time. Uh, they uncovered warning stones set into the temple, uh, one of which literally read, let no foreigner enter within the parapet of this partition, which surrounds the temple precinct. Anyone caught will be held accountable for his ensuing death. And so the temple prevented foreigners foreigners from worshiping but we see it also prevented women the blind 
and of course, the cripple, all barred from entering the only place during that early history where God's presence was manifested. And when you think about that, I I hope it makes you uncomfortable. That a temple built as a place for worship to our God and Father, the place designed to be a house of worship and the presence of God on earth was actually being a fortress built in opulence to prevent all but a select few from entering into the gates and worshiping. So we have the cripple, we have the temple, and lastly, I want to address the beautiful gate or the temple gate called beautiful. And this is where we really begin to see some real irony in this passage. You see the gate called beautiful, again, archaeology and history gives us some background on it. Uh, First of all, the gate itself was of unusual size and splendor. Again, the historian Josephus gives many interesting particulars about this gate, which he tells us was greatly excelled in workmanship and value above all others. All the gates around the temple were plated with gold and silver, but this one was still was more richly and thickly created. It was so much, so much larger than the other gates. This one was 50 cubits in height. The others were only 40. Uh, Josephus says that the weight was so great it took 20 men to move and move the gate to open it. And because of its massiveness and its magnificence, it obtained the well-earned title of the beautiful gate. And history tells us that because of its immense size and its beauty, it was the common door to use when entering the temple. And so since most people entered this door, it was truly a prime location for one to beg for money. But here is where the irony comes in. And it's this idea that a gate called beautiful would have the ugly task of preventing those with the greatest need from assessing the place that housed God. Sad. After all, there is nothing beautiful about restricting access from those who need it most. I mean, I mean, for some... The beautiful gate stood as an entryway into fellowship found in the gathering of a community within the temple courts. But for others, it stood as a barrier reminding the lame and the blind that society considered them less than and they were not welcomed inside of this sacred space. And I think this is where our lesson resides for us today. Knowingly or unknowingly, human beings for years have been erecting keep off the grass signs around themselves in their sacred spaces for centuries. And and the same is true of Christians today. Listen, Over the last few weeks, we have talked about this beautiful event that took place some 2,000 years ago at Pentecost. The giving of the Holy Spirit into the lives of believers. And we've been talking about this idea that we live in an age where God lives in us and we are the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. So we now are the temple of the Holy Spirit, living in us, gifting us, prompting us into action, calling us to task and mission as the church to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. It is in us 
that God now resides. And we look at this passage and we see that just as the crippled is brought to the beautiful gate, a man with physical limitations that making him an outsider to the temple community, we must realize that we also are met with people each and every one of us each and every day. And we need to understand that although these people may not have physical problems, many of them have spiritual problems. Many of them are crippled in other ways that just, it's just not as easy to see. So let me say, let me say it like this. There are people that God has placed in our path that are struggling with all kinds of problems, anxiety, loneliness, depression, insecurities. I mean, these people may not be physically limited. You may not be able to see their problems, but they are being crippled nonetheless, often buried deep down inside. And you, as a beautiful creation of God, hold the good news. You are carrying it with you to share it with the world, with those who are hurting, struggling, searching. You hold the very thing that people need the most. Are you allowing or are you restricting access from those who need it most. Listen, let me encourage each and every one of us today to share what has been given to us. Let us seek to give abundantly the joy that is knowing God the Father through Jesus Christ. Let us seek to show the world that the Holy Spirit is alive and active within us as we seek to glorify God in all that we say and do. Listen, are we acting as a beautiful bridge or a beautiful barrier to know Christ? Let me close with a few questions that I want you to wrestle with this week. And I include them, I included them in the sermon notes in you version. So feel free to discuss them this week. Number one, to the beggar, the beautiful gate was a paradox. It was an entry point for some and a barrier for others to keep them from the community of faith. What might a 21st century beggar identify as that beautiful thing that separates him or her from the people of faith in our church? Number two, the temple carried dual meanings to first century Hebrews. It carried this idea of opulence and wealth as well as divine presence. What meaning do people in our neighborhoods perceive about our congregation? Do they see us as a people longing for opulence and wealth? or for God's divine presence. Finally, three, the healing of the lame man signified a new era in which God's love was extended beyond the Israelite men to the least of these and the lost. How can we extend God's love beyond the membership of our congregation? Listen, this is a powerful passage ending with Peter and John reaching out and healing a man in need. Who are we reaching out to? Let's pray this morning. Father God, we come to you this morning thanking you and praising you for this place to come together and worship you. But Lord, let us always be mindful of those not present here of those that you have put in our path that we need to 
reach out to, to give a hand of healing to, so that they too may experience your divine presence and be healed. God, again, we thank you and praise you for how you call us into your service each and every day. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, again, hey, thank you for hanging out with us for some time. I hope you're enjoying this sermon series through Acts. And uh, until next week, God bless. You guys have a great week.